morning and welcome. We're happy to be here this morning, gathered in the sanctuary or gathered wherever you are at home. It's a quiet, sort of rainy day here in southeastern Pennsylvania. It's a good, quiet day to be in the presence of the Lord. And this morning we are graced by a beautiful bouquet of flowers at the altar this morning from the celebration going home service of our member Ruth Swartz this past week. Ruth was a member of this church since November 13th, 1966. She was 95 years old when she left us, leaving close to 100 grands, great-grands, and great-grandchildren, a tremendous testimony to us and to this large family. And I still see her sitting in that back chair back there every morning and very much knowing that she was listening and she would have a comment. So we praise God for her life and for this time together. But now let us settle into a time, let the world go away, and let us focus on preparing to worship our almighty God.
Good morning. Our centering words today come from James chapter 5, verses 7 through 8. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Now let us stand and come together in our call to worship. As we come together this morning, I say, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Come to Christ, whose words bring us eternal life. We have faith, knowing that Jesus is the Holy One of God. In this house of prayer, O God, we invoke your name. There is no one like you who keeps covenant and steadfast love for your servants who walk before you with all their heart. Not only have you lived on earth in Christ, but by the Spirit live in our hearts. Regard our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if you would join us in our opening praise, I love thy kingdom, Lord, found in your hymnal on page 540. You may be seated. And let us now bow before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and Heavenly Father, we come together this morning. We are happy for those of our members who are able to be on vacation, to find time away, to rest, and to have time together as families. But we know, O oh Lord, that you never rest that you are forever moving in this world. And dear Lord, we need your movement, your action now more than ever. We are stunned, we are heartbroken, we are wounded by the things we see happening in Afghanistan. We feel so powerless, O oh Lord, but we know you are all powerful to watch over all who are involved in this terrible crisis, to bring home safely those who have given of their time, their talents, their gifts in Afghanistan. And to bring this new government, may they see the light of the need of your love in the world. And we pray for your steadfast hand for all that is happening in these places of turmoil. And meanwhile, here at home, we still continue to fight with each other, sadly, over what is right as far as vaccinations and masks and going to school. Oh, Lord, we need your guidance now more than ever. We need your protection 
For we know that you see the bigger picture we cannot see. We know that as vast and majestic as your power is, you know each one of our hurts, each one of our pains, each one of our losses, each one of our fears. And help us to be like the ancient prophet of Jeremiah, who sat in the midst of turmoil and uncertainty, but still trusted you. And let us be like those disciples, even when others found the teaching to be too difficult, they trusted Jesus and stayed with him, even to the cross. For they trusted Jesus and your work through him. Give us that trust this morning, Lord, moment by moment, day by day, help us to trust you. But at the same time, open us up to possibilities to reach out into this hurting world. Things we might not think of, but people you will bring to us, ways you will show us, help us be an agent of healing in this world. And above all this morning, we praise you for your son Jesus, in whose name we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hear now these good words of assurance. Friends, indeed, hear the good news. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it to consecrate it, cleansing it by water and word, so that he might present the church to himself all glorious, with no stain or wrinkle or anything of the sort, but holy and without blemish. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And we this morning are the very personification, whether we're present here or in our homes and watching together, we are the very embodiment of that church. So let us now prayerfully return to God, gifts for the work of his kingdom. a doxology, please.
Heavenly Father, there is no gift we can bring that compares with the gift of your Son, given that we might know eternal life. We want the whole world to hear this good news. So bless these gifts to bring that kingdom on earth. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You may be seated. The Hebrew scripture lesson today comes from Jeremiah chapter 15, verses 15 through 21. Lord, you understand. Remember me and care for me. Avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering. Do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me and you had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? You are to me like a deceptive brook, like a spring that fails. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you, that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you to rescue and save you, declares the Lord. I will save you from the hands of the wicked and deliver you from the grasp of the cruel. And our epistle lesson today comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled about your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in its place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. And now if you will join us for the Psalter, it will be Psalm 84, which can be found on page 805 of your Pule Hymnal. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. O Lord of hosts, my ruler and my God, at your altars even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose hearts are the highways to Zion. As they go through the Valley of Tears, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord of God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord is a sun and a shield and bestows favor and honor. 
No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed are those who trust in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now let us stand as able for the reading of the gospel. The gospel lesson this morning continues our study of the book of John, chapter 6, beginning with verse 56. This is Jesus speaking. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, but not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is too difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending before he was before? It is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. But the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. And because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This teaching is too difficult. Who can accept it? For quite a while now, people have been following along with Jesus on his trek through the countryside. The disciples, yes, but as Jesus has moved on, the crowds have grown in number as his reputation is spread. They've come to see the miracles, to see the healing, and to be fed. They've heard how he fed a crowd of 5,000 with an offering of just a few fish and loaves, and like so many of us, when we find a good thing, we want more. And there is so much more to be had. Jesus has fed the body, healed the body, and now he wants to feed and heal the soul. And the greatest disease of the soul, then and in our time, is our separation from God. Sin, in fact, as defined as that which comes between us and God. But something is required of us if we are to receive this nourishment for the soul, and that is the unequivocal commitment to follow this Jesus of Nazareth, first and foremost. And if we do this, all our actions will flow from the love of God for us that Jesus has come to share with us. We are called to leave behind our fears, our anger, our petty and not so petty grudges, and be transformed into a new life in Christ. When Revelation 21.4 promises that God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, the tears over our past mistakes and hurts will be gone. And since, as Revelation 21.3 promises that God's dwelling place is among us on earth, we know that these are not static one-time events, but continual, 
ongoing, for all time life promises. And this is the reality in which Jesus is calling the crowds that are following him. He's calling them to come into this new reality. They've seen what he can do, but his he healing and his feeding and his teaching are but a sample of what God wants our lives to be like when we make that decision to follow him. Or as the hymn writer has so beautifully said it, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. I'm born of his spirit and washed in his blood. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my savior am happy and blessed. I'm watching and waiting, I'm looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. Let go of the past, walk in the newness of life. Yes, we are told at this point, many people turned away from Jesus. This teaching is difficult, who can accept it? Yes, the crowds followed and grew as long as there was free food, spectacles, miracles, but total submission, giving up all our secret vices and prejudices. A commentator points out that the phrase that says teaching is hard doesn't translate as hard to understand, but hard to accept. And William Barclay in his commentary on this passage points out that, quote, to this day, many a person refuses Christ, not because it, it puzzles the intellect, but because it challenges the way we live. And essentially what Jesus is saying in these discourses is that true life-giving power comes from the Holy Spirit and only the Holy Spirit. Our physical body, our flesh is of no help. And Barclay goes on to say, all things are human things are trivial if they exist for nothing beyond themselves. The real value of anything depends on its purpose, the aim in doing it or having it. Things of the flesh all gain their value from the spirit in which they are done. And at this point in scripture is a turning point for Jesus' ministry. From here, he will journey on toward Jerusalem and toward the cross. Now, some people in these crowds saw quite clearly where this journey was heading. He knew they, he was on a collision course to clash with the authorities in Jerusalem. And they may even have heard that there was a price on his head. They've enjoyed the spectacle, the free food. Perhaps some of them have even been recipients of healing, but they're going to get out in time before they required to make any real sacrifice. They disappeared at the first inkling of the cross. And today we have many people who may attend church because it makes them feel good about themselves. That's a great start. That's the call of the Holy Spirit saying, you need to be here, but there's more. There's much more. Or many of them may come uh, in order to be seen in the community or to be able to list in their bios for some reason that they belong to such and such a church. And for them, it's a means and an end. But again, once they get through that door, the call of the Holy Spirit says, there is more. Because many times ask them to sacrifice in any way, giving their time, a portion of their income, or any type of a commitment and they are extremely put upon and quick to move down the street. Just like those who left Jesus in these passages, they were here to get from Jesus, but are not willing to suffer with him and for him. And the sad part of this is that in turning away from the commitment to follow Jesus, we're turning away from the peace and assurance of God's caring love that will carry us even through the most difficult moment of life. As Jesus told this crowd in verse 63, it is the spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I, Jesus, have spoken to you are spirit and life, but among you there are some who do not believe. And so we come to this sad scene described in verse 66. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. In other words, we're not willing to risk, we're not willing, we'd rather do it on our own, when in fact what we are being called is to just take the next step. Not to worry about the outcome because the outcome is in God's hands, but many turned back. 
There's a story told about an artist who set out to paint his vision of the Last Supper. It was a huge project and it took him many years to complete. He chose models for the disciples that he felt represented the biblical story about each one of them. He chose a model for Jesus in the very beginning, a young man with a face of exceptional translucent beauty. And then he spent many years painting all the other disciples until at last he needed a model for Judas. And we all know Judas had betrayed Christ. But yet Judas was present at the Last Supper. So the artist went out and he searched the lowest haunts of the city to find a model so depraved, so destroyed, so ugly that he felt he would represent Judas after his betrayal of Christ. And when the sittings were at end and the painting was finished, the model for Jesus said to the painter, you know, you painted me once before. Surely not, the artist said. Oh yes, the man replied. Way back in the beginning when you first started, I was the model for your portraits of Christ. The years of life can be cruel. They can take away our ideals, our beauty, our enthusiasm, our dreams, our loyalties. They can leave us with a life that is smaller, that is not bigger. They can leave us with a heart that shriveled instead of expanded and filled with the love of Christ. But as Paul wrote to the young church at Ephesus, as Amber read for us today, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Yes, we all face struggles in our lives. Sometimes we seem to go from pain to pain, but we do not go alone. Say yes to Jesus and do not turn back. Go in the blessed assurance that no general would ever send an army into battle without the proper equipment to ensure victory. And this is Paul's point, writing to this struggling young church. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, that armor that God will provide you through the Spirit, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then. And he goes on to talk about the, buck, the uh, buckle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, fit, our feet fitted in righteousness that comes from the gospel. And that comes from preparing ourselves through daily study, Bible study, group study, just calling each other up to say, how are you today? to remember that we are all supporting each other in this. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So when Jesus asks you, as he asked the 12, do you also wish to go away? Are you prepared to say, as Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jeremiah knew that as well, centuries before Jesus, when he was lost and afraid for his own life as well as for what was going on. And people were so afraid to trust he prayed, as we read this morning, Lord, you understand. Remember me, care for me, avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering. Do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them. And here's an interesting metaphor. We've talked time to time about different images that reoccur in the Bible. How many times can you, off the top of your head, Think of the recurring theme of eating, beginning with the apple in the garden and going all the way through to the Last Supper and beyond. God wants to feed us. God wants to feed our souls and strengthen us. When your words came to me, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, Lord God Almighty. And then Jeremiah sits with this assurance. 
If you repent, God tells Jeremiah, I will restore you that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesperson. Those words may have been written to Jeremiah many, many, many years ago. They're written to us today. And so us, let us, like Jeremiah, stand on the promises of God. And let us stand and sing this beautiful hymn as a commitment to stand on God's promises. As we go from this place today, go standing on the promises. You cannot fail. Take that assurance and take this benediction. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit walk with you now and forever. Amen. And you all may be seated. <clears throat> 